Well, good afternoon, man. I hope uh, this uh, message finds you safe and warm and uh, wrapped up with a nice cup of coffee or a uh, hot tea or something. And uh, as you can see from my backyard, I got quite a lot of snow last night. I'm not sure about where you live, but um, yeah, it snowed pretty good last night. Anyway, we're on lesson 15. We're actually at the halfway point of our study of John. So it's exciting to be on the backside and uh, looking forward to our next study, uh, Revelation. So as we get, uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and open up in prayer and we'll get started tonight. Loving, gracious Father, we just thank you for this time that we have together. And we thank you for uh, <clears throat> the word that is in John. And I just ask that you open the ears and eyes of our hearts. So as we step into his word, that uh, we get a deeper understanding of you. And that through this understanding, we grow closer and more dependent on you each and every day. We just lift this up in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So on July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 became the first manned mission to land on the moon. Between 1969 and 1972, the U.S. actually had six manned lunar landings. Despite all of this evidence, the astronauts' own testimony, pictures, videos, physical evidence of rocks, my dad believed it was all a hoax. He believed it was all a stunt that was staged and filmed in the desert somewhere. So how much evidence is, is necessary for you to believe in something or someone? Are you one that will only believe if you are an eyewitness? And even is that enough? Are you still looking for more evidence proving Jesus is who he says he is? In our lesson this week, we see the disciples, Mary and Martha, the Jewish religious leaders, all had a different understanding of Jesus. The disciples still didn't understand that Jesus was omniscient. He was all-knowing. Mary and Martha didn't completely understand that Jesus was omnipotent. He was all-powerful. And the Jewish leader, religious leaders didn't understand that Jesus was sovereign. He was all-controlling. I'm pretty sure the disciples, Mary, Martha, and many others, after witnessing the miracle, left having a more complete understanding of who Jesus was. Because as we saw, others saw him as a threat and set their hearts to eliminate him. So our big idea tonight, Jesus has power and authority over all circumstances, including life and death. Jesus has power and authority over all circumstances, including life and death. John's purpose in writing his gospel account was so the reader would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have eternal life. And as we'll see, this was one of the reasons Jesus delayed his trip in response to the news about Lazarus. So I've broken chapter 11 into two divisions. They are the power to restore life in verses 1 through 44, and the second, the plot to destroy life in 45 through 57. <clears throat> so as we look back last week, we see, we saw again the Jewish leaders were incensed by Jesus' claim to be God. In verse 1033, it says, The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. So the timing was right, wasn't right wasn't right, so Jesus withdraws to a place beyond the Jordan. It was at this place that Jesus received the urgent message from Mary and Martha. In John eleven three, it says, Therefore the sister sent him an urgent message to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. There was a special connection between this family and Jesus. They loved Jesus, and he loved them. <clears throat> Some actually believe that the father of Mary and Martha and Lazarus was Simon the leper that Jesus healed, that we read about that Jesus healed in Matthew 26 and Mark 14. While the message didn't ask for anything, they trusted that Jesus' heart would be stirred, and then they left the request in his hands. How often do I just lay a message at Jesus' feet? You know, so many times I lay a message at Jesus' feet, but then I turn around and tell him how I want it fixed. I tend to forget that Jesus is omniscient and he's omnipotent. 
he knows what I'm going through. He knows what how he's going to respond. I need to learn to trust him. So Jesus knew the message about Lazarus was coming. <clears throat> he knew the moment Lazarus became ill. He knew the situation was dire. He also knew what he was going to do. In verse 4, it says, When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Jesus, being God, knew that Lazarus was dying or had already passed away. But his love for the family and his desire to do God's will moved him to stay where he was for two more days. God had a purpose in delaying Jesus' response. You know, it's hard to reconcile what we know in our head and what we want in our heart. Why are responses to our prayers and petition delayed or at times seem to go unanswered? It is during these times of struggle that God deepens and stretches our faith and our dependence in Him. These moments build character, patience, and perseverance. When God doesn't answer our prayers in the ways we want, He's doing something greater that we can't yet understand. And this is where 2020 hindsight is so beautiful. When we look back, we can see how God orchestrated events and circumstances in order that He may be glorified. That all glory goes to Him. So two days after receiving the message from Mary and Martha, Jesus said in verse 7, Let us go to Judea again. You know, we see, again, the disciples still didn't have a complete understanding of who they were rolling with. <clears throat> Can't you see the look on their face when Jesus said this? Are you kidding me? Lord, those guys, we go back in there, they're locked and loaded. They have the rocks piled up. They're ready. They tried to stone you before, and now you want to go back? How about we put this up for a vote, and the majority wins? They apparently didn't catch what he said about his life in John 10, 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. God was in control. Because the disciples were walking with Jesus, the light of the world, they too were safe under God's protective care until his purpose for them on earth was done. As we'll see in our second division, God's sovereign, sovereign authority orchestrates circumstances and events to accomplish his will. It was God who set the time when Jesus would say, It is finished. When Jesus finally arrived, it says in verse 17 that he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Most likely he was already dead when Jesus received the message. So why did he wait? Why does the timing matter? Timing matters because God was doing something greater. As soon as Martha heard Jesus was coming, she rushes out to meet him. John eleven twenty one through 22 says, Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Martha knew Jesus was special. She trusted that God listened to him. However, as you read about this exchange in verses 23 through 27, Raising her brother back to life at that moment was not on her mind. When Jesus said, your brother will rise again, she responded, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha knew her scriptures, and she recalled the message of hope in the Old Testament. Daniel 12, 1-2 says, Everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Jesus was taking Martha much, much deeper. And this is where we find his fifth I am statement. Verses 25 through 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? As I said before, she knew Jesus was special, but at that moment, when she answered, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world, her faith grew deeper and certainly more complete. 
she acknowledged that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God, and he's the one God promised would come into the world to save people from their sins. Everyone must answer this question that Jesus asked Mar Martha. Who we believe Jesus is determines our destiny. I think Steve Benton uh, summed it up so well on Saturday. Those born once will die twice. Once physically and then spiritually. Those born twice may die only once physically. Those born once will die twice. Once physically and then spiritually. Those born twice may die only once physically. So if I claim to be a Christian, how does my everyday life reflect that I've been born again? That I've been born twice? After making her confession of faith, Martha runs back to Mary. The teacher has come and is calling you. When Mary arrives, she falls at Jesus' feet and says the same thing as Martha. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have died. And as Jesus looks around in verse 33, we read, Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. This phrase, he groaned in the spirit, is also used in verse 38. <clears throat> it's between 33 and 38 that we read the shortest verse in the Bible. 1135, Jesus wept. So why did Jesus weep? He knew he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. That was certainly something not to weep about. He certainly had compassion for Mary and Martha. They were grieving the loss of their brother, but they were about to experience great joy. So why did he weep? This is where reading different translations and even doing a word study brings a much, much deeper understanding. <clears throat> The Greek word used in verse 33 and 38 is embri mahomai. The meaning is to be moved with anger or to be moved with indignation. It's these different translations that you get these understandings. And I think the message says it well. It says a deep anger welled up within him. But why? Why would seeing people mourn make him angry? Dr. Thomas Constable provides a great explanation. He says, Jesus knew the misery that death inflicted on mankind and on the loved ones of those who die. <clears throat> the cause of all this misery, sin. Many of those who came with Mary were from Jerusalem, where he had encountered this stubborn unbelief. The sin of unbelief would result in the second death, spiritual, the source of eternal grief and mourning. Spiritual death will result in the source of eternal grief and mourning. So Jesus felt angry because he was face to face with the consequences of sin, and in particular, unbelief. So we're building to a climactic moment in verses 38 through 44, as everyone moved to the tomb. So in verses 39 through 40, Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, and for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? We now see the purpose of Jesus' delay. God's strategic timing set the stage to unveil and to reveal his identity, his divinity, sorry. The four days would prove without a doubt that Lazarus was dead. There was certainly no more hope. But Jesus was about to open their eyes to his omnipotence. Don't you know that as they rolled the stone away, Mary, Martha, and all the Jews and everyone around there were just holding their breath, anticipating the smell? And as they were just kind of just reeling, knowing that it was about to hit him, Jesus pauses and prays. Father, I thank you that you heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because 
of the people who are standing by, I said this, that, ye, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus came so people could believe and that by believing, we would have life. Jesus showed that death doesn't have the final word. I am does. So after praying, Jesus calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. So what great evidence and proof that Jesus is truly the good shepherd? Back in verses 10 through 1027, it says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they follow me. Lazarus heard the voice of Jesus and came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. So this brings us to our first principle and applications for tonight. Jesus has the power and authority to give new life to dead hearts. Jesus has the power and authority to give new life to dead hearts. So how does Jesus' power over death offer me hope today? How does Jesus' power over death offer me hope today? And what fears about my death are calmed by faith that I too will experience the power of resurrection. What fears about my death are calm by faith that I too will experience this power of resurrection. <clears throat> the doctrine for this week's lesson is resurrection. Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead is a preview of Jesus defeating death on the cross. It's also an indisputable display of his power and authority over life and death. Lazarus was raised back to life, not necessarily resurrected. A true resurrection is one that returns a person to a permanent state of life, one in which the person is never subject to death again. Also, resurrection is a transformation into a new body, one that is fundamentally different than the one that preceded it. Lazarus didn't face judgment, nor did he escape death forever. He was brought back to life in his existing corrupt body. He would die again. But imagine the rejoicing and celebration that happened as Lazarus was reunited with his family and friends. So as we step into this week, I want you to take some time this week and contemplate what it will be like when you take your last breath on this earth and your lungs are filled with the breath of eternity. And you experience Revelation 21.4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. What a beautiful scene, or beautiful experience to focus on. So moving on to our last 12 verses and the plot to destroy life. The raising of Lazarus really ruffled the religious leader's feathers. This was too much. They could no longer wait. So in verses 45 to 57, we see God's sovereignty in play as he uses these selfish and hard hearts to fill his plan for the cross. Many who saw Jesus' miracle believed, but others ran and reported it to the Pharisees. For the Pharisees and Sadducees, it appears no evidence, no amount of evidence was going to change their hearts, not even eyewitnesses. So in verse 47, we see, Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. <clears throat> if we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. You know, signs point the way to something or to someone. Jesus' signs did that. They were to help them recognize and believe the Messiah. However, even though they recognized the signs, they chose to reject the truth and discourage people from believing in Jesus. Jesus, though, was minimizing their influence, and he threatened their wealth. He threatened their perceived power and authority and certainly was exposing their sham loyalty to Rome. Caiaphas, the high priest, spoke up and said, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that, is, that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people 
and not that the whole nation should perish. He didn't even know what he was talking about. God gave him those words. They were oblivious to the fact that their plot to destroy was God using man's wicked plan to accomplish his will and to fulfill the promise he made in Genesis 3.15. God is sovereign, even using people's sin and wickedness to accomplish his redemptive plan and purpose. You know, it's crazy to think that these religious leaders tried hard to keep people from believing. They were even willing to violate the commandments given to Moses by God, Thou shalt not kill, to silence Jesus and his message of salvation. Jesus proved that God is the ultimate promise keeper. God demonstrated his, his sovereignty, fulfilling his promises and keeping his covenant despite man's sin and rejection. It was God who had authority over what, when Jesus was died. Die. The religious leaders would not have the last word. I am would when he said, it is finished. <clears throat> so this brings us to our final principle and applications. Jesus has the power and authority to overrule everyone and everything opposed to him. Jesus has the power and authority to overrule everyone and everything opposed to him. So how have I seen God accomplish his purposes even when people oppose him? How have I seen God accomplish his purposes even when people are fighting against him? And where is God sending me to shine the light of his resurrection power? Where is God sending me to shine the light of his resurrection power? And how can I do that this week? How sad it is to see people who don't believe in Jesus' resurrection or their own resurrection, thinking that they have everything under control. Believing on life on earth is as good as it's going to get. They waste their life focused on the here and now and on things that are earthly significant, but not eternally significant. But you know, our gracious and loving God is always pursuing the lost. He has his sovereign ways of breaking people so they have nowhere else to turn but to him. When they do, these words come true. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of earth will go, grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You know, God has given us everything we need to believe. We don't need any more signs. We don't need any more miracles. We don't need any more words of wisdom. We have it all. We have a choice to make of who Jesus says he is. So let's all go and make Jesus known. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we just thank you for God's word. We thank for God's truth that uh, John uh, wrote in his gospel, that uh, he wrote it so that people would believe and would have eternal life. Lord, if there's anyone that is uh, delaying their decision, lay in their heart, bring people around them so that they make the decision today, right now, that you are the Christ. You are our Savior and Lord. And Lord, safely uh, keep each and every one of these men uh, warm and comfortable and safe as they uh, travel around this evening or this afternoon. And uh, we will see everyone shortly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good afternoon, guys, and uh, we'll hopefully see you next week. Bye.